Hello, my name is David Nachman. I'm one of the managing attorneys at the NPZ Law Group. I'm here this afternoon with Ludka Zimocek, who's also one of the managing attorneys. And we just recently received information, um, what, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, with regard to who won the registration in the H-1B lottery. So uh, the much-awaited H-1B lottery results are out as of uh, March 31st, March 30th. And uh, Ludka, um, obviously, there are going to be a lot of winners. There are going to be a lot of losers. But obviously, I think we're going to be in a uh, very interesting situation because our phones are going to be ringing nonstop because people are going to want to know what options are available to them if they didn't win the H-1B lottery. So, Ludka, tell me, like, what would you say to someone who's calling up and asking you, what are my options? First of all, I would have to see their resume. So that's probably the most important thing. For those that, and unfortunately, I think there are not too many people that were selected this year. So the percentage was not very favorable. So we actually are getting a lot of calls. And you know, for those that are not our clients, the first thing would be just to see the resume and see what the credentials are so we can properly assess the options. Exactly. So there are other non-immigrant visa options, work visa options that are available to individuals. And probably one which uh, right up front is something people should consider is the fact that there are cap-exempt H-1Bs. So what's a cap-exempt H-1B? So cap-exempt H-1B is really good option for those that were not selected. So of course, universities, colleges, that's no brainer. And then we have other organizations, um, nonprofit organizations, 501c3 organization uh, that are doing some type of research. And, you know, interestingly, they don't even know. They may not know that they are cap-exempt uh, organizations. So many times our clients will go to the nonprofit organization and they will ask them, can you do the H-1B? Are you cap exempt? Oftentimes they really don't know. So it's really the role, our role, and also the applicant's role to kind of check and see if they would be able to proceed with the cap exempt organizations. And of course, then there are any organizations that are affiliated with schools academic institutions exactly and so for example especially in this uh especially in this landscape this new unprecedented time one of the things that we're likely to see is that academic institutions are going to throw their weight behind incubators and organizations that help with startups and financing and getting businesses going so here's an opportunity where maybe there's an affiliation with an academic institution. So people should obviously look at that as one of the options. So what other things should people be looking at if they don't have the opportunity for a cap exempt H-1B? Are there other work visa options that they can look at? Of course, um, some of the options are based on nationality. So it's very important, you know, the question that how many passports, how many nationalities do you hold? Because there are some solely based on the nationality. Example, TN. That's a perfect example for our Canadian and Mexican uh, clients because we can file it at any point. There is no cap, no deadline. So it's really good option. Next we one. Also make, yeah, I was going to say our Australians. We should make yes. them aware of the three for professional Australians coming to the United States to serve in a professional and specialty occupation, right? And what perfect. about... What about uh, E2s, E2s, E1s? Those are also country specific, right? That's based on treaty. So there are actually many countries listed, some for E1s, for E2s. And again, there is no deadline, no filing deadline, no cap. So E2 as investor's visa, it's a really good option for those that are interested in buying a business or even starting the business if they have enough finances, of course. And what if I'm feeling spiritually enlightened and I've been working for a religious organization, is that a potential work visa option? Yeah, there is always an option for an R1 visa category because, you know, it is for ministers and priests, but also for religious workers. So if there is an offer of an employment from a church, temple, or other religious organizations, that would be a great option. And what if you have a person who is extraordinary in their field? 
okay? Someone who is uh, very, very well healed, has publications, has contributions of intellectual property, is extending a body of academic knowledge in a particular field. What kind of non-immigrant visa classification is that? David, so that sounds as a perfect O-1. And, you know, with the O-1, if we receive resume prior to H-1Bs, we may even consider not to do the H-1B. If someone has a great O-1 case as an extraordinary um, uh, ability person, then maybe it's better just to proceed with the O-1, O-1A or O-1B. Well, O-1Bs, like O-1Bs are the artist visas for Correct. individuals who are doing something in the arts field. And what's really nice about that O-1B is it's not extraordinary ability as we know it, it's prominence or distinction in the field. So it's a lower legal standard and easier for us to prove. So it's very important to also ask about hobbies because we may have a student who is uh, gonna be an engineer, maybe has a great profile, but that student may be uh, really good in some type of form of art or even sports. So there are many available options. It's very important to explore the resume, the hobbies, what is, if they are married, what is the spouse doing? So it, it's kind of like a detective work. So Ludka, I think what you're saying to me, and I hope that all our viewers are hearing this clearly, is that in order to figure out a way to immigrate to the United States, which can be obviously employment-based, or it can be family-based, or it can be some other methodology. It's not a cookie-cutter analysis. It's really every single person's case is different, correct. and they shouldn't be directed into any one particular option. They should keep That's their correct. mind open. And, they, and basically what it is is that the value would be that if they come to us or they go to uh, uh, legal counselors who are familiar with the immigration programs that are out there and explore all the options, they may be able to find, I guess, on a best to worst list and then go from there, yes. right? Exactly. So our, our role is to provide options and not to just tell them you need to do an H-1B. It's, it's important for them to know what the options are and so they can make informed decisions. Exactly. Ludka, that is great information. Thank you so much for being with me this afternoon. And um, thanks so much for all our viewers who are tuning in. And we hope to be able to bring you some other ways to look at the U.S. and Canadian immigration uh, world. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank Bye. you very much.